morning all of you. Before we start the topic, uh, a few questions. I think uh, to begin with, I will take just one question per uh, center. So, there are two uh, questions here, one from Trichy and one from Jaipur. Let me first take the question from Trichy. One question at a time. If there are not many hand holdings, hand raisings, then maybe I will come back to that center for the second question. PTT student video. Good morning, Trichy. Over to you for your question. Sir, you, you deduce the first law that uh, behavior between adiabatic and non adiabatic. Uh, that is uh, about the work heat interaction and later to zero at the existence of isothermal state and being isothermal is a transient state in the state space of all system you said. Then uh, in the second law you say that which is possible which is not possible and the direction of energy transfer. So you uh, study the say in the zero at the law you, is that any temperature is uh, clearly uh, explained or in the only in the second law the temperature is clearly explained I want to know. Over oh, to you sir. Uh, temperature exists in basically two laws the zeroth law and the second law and when we discuss second law we reviewed the status of temperature from the zeroth law. In the first law the way we uh, developed it there is no mention of temperature at all. It is only adiabatic processes and initial state and final state and work interaction. Zeroth law tells us that there is something called thermal equilibrium that is the existence. Then we said that being in thermal equilibrium of uh, the property of two states being in thermal equilibrium is a transitive property. And that is what we traditionally know as zeroth law that A is in thermal equilibrium in B and B is in thermal equilibrium with C. That means, uh, and then A is in thermal equilibrium with C. So, now this existence and uh, transition uh, transitive laws tell us that in the state space of any system there will be pair of isotherms actually ap corresponding isotherms. So, there will be a set of isothermal states in the state space of system A, a corresponding set of isothermal states in the state space of system B and a corresponding uh, set of isothermal states in the state space of uh, any system. Okay. And uh, just for convenience, we label these states as uh, with some labels, so that we can identify whether a given state from the state space of system A and another given state from the state space of system B are isothermal or not. Uh, zeroth law just tells us that if they are isothermal, then by definition there will be no heat transfer and then because isothermals have the label called temperature, we say such states have the same temperature. If we find that the two states say A 1 and B 1 of two different systems or two systems A and B happen to be non isothermal from zeroth law point of view we can only say that heat will be transferred between them if they are brought into contact with each other across a diathermic wall. It does not tell us in which direction the heat will be transferred because the labels called temperature mentioned in the zeroth law, they do not mention any higher temperature or a lower temperature. The numerical value of higher temperature and lower temperature gets assigned when we map those isotherms onto some convenient thermometer. That is why we have 0 Celsius, 100 Celsius, 30 Celsius, 50 Celsius. Here the idea of a higher temperature simply means higher on a Celsius scale, it is not thermodynamic higher or lower and this is where zeroth law ends. When it comes to second law, 
the second law is much more detailed than either the zeroth law or the first law that we would have noticed. Okay. First law has one simple statement and two derivations. One, the idea of energy or change in energy of a system, and second, the uh, heat transfer in non-adiabatic processes. These are the only things which come out of first law. Uh, out of zeroth law comes the idea of temperature and then thermometry takes over about how to label those isotherms conveniently. It is in the second law that we have many, many things involved. We start with just a single statement that is the Kel Kelvin Planck statement and then using definitions of uh, an engine, a 2 T heat engine, a reversible process and a reversible cycle and a reversible engine would derive a lot many things. For example, we derive that the uh, there is a we derive first that there is a hierarchy of temperature and using second law we define temperature as higher or lower. What is our definition of a higher temperature? Given two isothermal uh, two non isothermal states at say T 1 and T 2, take a system at T 1, another system at T 2, try to work a 2 T heat engine, reversible or otherwise does not matter. All we need is that it be a engine between the two systems, one at T 1 and one at T 2. So, let us say system 1 and system 2. If you find that the engine works by taking heat in from the system at 1, rejecting heat at 2 and producing some positive amount of work, then we say that the temperature of 1 is higher than the temperature of 2. That is our definition of higher and lower temperature. If it is the other way round, if it takes it from 2, rejects it to 1 and produces work, then we say T 2 will be higher than T 1. So, among other things, second law also helps us define the gradation of temperatures higher and lower. Now, this definition of higher and lower is just to be consistent with the temperature scales in which higher numbers are given to so called hotter stuff. We have psychologically decided that, that the steam point is, at, is hotter than the ice point or a system at the steam point is hotter than the system at the ice point. So, using second law when it comes to defining a higher and lower temperature, we define it appropriately. So, this is just for being consistent uh, and there is nothing more in it. Over to you. For a doubt. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Brahmara. Over to you. Good morning, sir. Uh, the question is uh, related to free expansion. Uh, let us say there is a closed system with a gas in it at some pressure and temperature. Uh, if it expands against uh, free expansion and reaches a final volume V2, can we calculate the work done as uh, PDB work or uh, since it is against uh, no resistance, is the work done zero? The question is about free expansion. Uh, Let us discuss it with some detail because here it is important to sketch the system diagram. If you are thinking of free expansion in a uh, vessel and we have a problem somewhere where a vessel had a wall in between and there was a gas here and there was vacuum here. And here the free expansion or sudden expansion was uh, initiated by removing this wall. So, the gas would uh, expand occupy the vacuum of course, a non quasi static process all that you would know is initially the volume was V 1, finally the volume was V 2, initially may be the pressure was something this was the initial state 1, finally the pressure would reduce any gas because the volume is higher, but we do not know what is the path in between. So, it is not a quasi static process and it is not a uh, 
it is not a process in which the work can be, the expansion work can be determined. The same thing is true of, uh, you know, the argument then goes like this. Uh, suppose I have a um, gas, but instead of a partition, uh, let us say, let us say this thing is open, but I have a piston and say on this side is vacuum and we have a gas initially at some pressure P naught and the initial volume is V naught. Okay. And then I will argue that look, uh, the piston will suddenly get accelerated, so the situation is very similar to this and the V 2 will be the point where the piston is made to stop for some reason or something else happens. Okay. Then the, um, uh, but you can say that look, the gas will provide a force on the piston of P naught A and then you say I can make the piston of a very heavy mass M, so that this under this influence this mass will not suddenly move the piston, it will accelerate it slowly. Well, if it accelerates slowly and during the acceleration if you can measure the pressure and volume that means, at any instant you are sure of the position of the piston, at if in any instant by means of measurements, if you are sure that the pressure in the gas is uniform, then under that uh, assumption you can have a quasi static process. So, if you have a heavy piston which moves or accelerates slowly, then under in that condition you will be approaching a quasi static process, but if you say it is a lightweight piston, it shoots off, it is unlikely to be quasi static. Over to you. Thank you sir, over to you. Now, I will go to PhD Coimbatore. PSG Coimbatore, good morning, over to you. Hello sir, good morning sir. There are two questions here. Uh, first one, can you please expl explain me once again the character statement of second law. The second question is, uh, what is the difference between vapor and gas? Over to you sir. I will take the second question first. There is in the thermodynamics as well as in normal English, the distinction between a vapor and a gas is a bit confusing. You can use either and it does not make any difference, except that when uh, you have a gas uh, which is in contact with a fluid its own liquid, okay. maybe it is in equilibrium, maybe it is in not in equilibrium or maybe it is in a stage which is superheated, but a reasonable reduction in temperature or a small increase in pressure can liquefy it, then we tend to call it a vapor. When it is far away from the liquid vapor dome in the state space, we tend to call it a gas. For example, at uh, room temperature, at one atmosphere pressure, we will call nitrogen a gas, whereas uh, the same nitrogen when it uh, slowly evaporates from a liquid nitrogen flask uh, will uh, generally be known as nitrogen vapor. So, that way the two words are more or less interchangeable except that generally when you are near the liquid vapor zone, you tend to call it a vapor when you are far away from it, you tend to call it a gas, there is nothing special about it. Uh, for the Carathéodory theorem or Carathéodory formulation of the second law, uh, we do not really have to worry about it, but remember we have sort of derived it indirectly from our Kelvin-Planck statement. 
the Kelvin Planck statement says that uh, a 1T heat engine is not possible. We have derived uh, from that the following thing. We have said that d s is greater than or equal to d q by t. This is the entropy principle. Okay. This means that for any adiabatic process, this is for any process. For any adiabatic process, we will have d s is greater than or equal to 0. That means, if we start from a state of a system and execute only adiabatic processes, we will reach states which will be either at the same entropy or at the higher entropy. We know that in the state space there will be an isentropic line, this is isentropic. So, if you execute adiabatic processes, we may have d s equals 0. Let us say this is higher entropy states and these are lower entropy states. And if this is our state, by executing adiabatic processes, we will reach states which are anywhere on this side at higher entropy or in the limiting case, the same entropy we will never reach states here. Okay. And this is what we have derived, this is what it means. What Carre Theodori has done is rather than start from the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law of thermodynamics, he started with this as the statement, but without calling it an entropy. It says that uh, in the neighborhood of the state space of any point, there are states which you cannot reach through quasi static adiabatic processes. That is it. That means, you can reach some states, you cannot reach some states. And using this, he derived all the characteristics that we have derived of the second law. Okay. However, the mathematics is uh, very involved. Uh, there are Actually, his paper is very informative. Unfortunately, it is in uh, French. Uh, there are two books. Um, uh, for some reason, neither of them in mainstream thermodynamics, which give a um, compact but uh, concise and reasonably complete introduction to the Carre Theodori's formulation. One is by S. Chandrasekhar, the Nobel laureate. I think the title of the book is Introduction to Stellar Structure. First or second chapter of this will have the Carre Theodori's form explained. And the second one is a technical book Boli and Weiner. I am not sure whether this is E I or I E. It is uh, I think introduction to thermal stress analysis or theory of thermal stresses or something. But thermal stresses are the key words in the title. Both are well known books, a good library should have this in the physics section and this in the solid mechanics or stress analysis section. You will find in these books uh, enough uh, introduction, but if you look up, um, there are many, many other papers etcetera, which have uh, argued for, against, tried to analyze Carre Theodori's derivations in detail. Uh, they go into deep mathematics, which is not so easily understandable. Carre Theodori's work itself is from 1909 and uh, it is in French. The paper is available, uh, I think it is downloadable from some sites, but since it is in French, um, it is a bit difficult to understand, because although it is mathematical, so it is full of symbols, but there are arguments also 
which are purely in French. Over. Sir, good morning. Uh, this is my question is regarding entropy. Is there any physical definition for entropy? Over to you, sir. That is the last question I am taking from your center because half an hour is over. Uh, there is no physical definition of entropy. The way entropy we have uh, we have defined entropy using a integral d q by t for a reversible process. That is our first final and proper definition of entropy for us. Uh, Jaipur Engineering College, I hope you are able to hear me, but uh, when I say over, just start asking questions because uh, I am able to hear you. Over to you. Sir, if, uh, if an internal energy is the function of temperature only, then if you refer the steam table at 100 degree Celsius, one bar pressure, there are two different values of UG and UF. Why it is so? Uh, remember internal energy internal energy is a function of temperature only only for an ideal gas is water and water vapor and ice etc an ideal gas no moment they are not uh, ideal gases or it cannot be modeled as an ideal gas the question of you being a function only of temperature uh, does not arise. For any other gas, vapor, fluid, U will be a function of temperature and something else, pressure, volume, dryness fraction, some other variable of state. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Over and all. I will just take one question each from NIT Calicut and Amrita, then we will start the formal session today. NIT Calicut, good morning and over to you. Can you please explain partition motion machine of particular second kind? Uh, the question is uh, about the perpetual motion machine of the first kind and the second kind. This has already been discussed, so I am surprised that the questions are coming up, the same questions are coming up again and again are being uh, asked on Moodle. I will just quickly say that a perpetual machine, motion machine of first kind is something, some process which violates the first law of thermodynamics. PMM of the second kind, it is a process or a machine which violates the second law of thermodynamics. That is it, there is nothing more about this. So, over and out, I am going to the other center. Amruta Kohimtur, good morning, over to you. Good morning, sir. I am Ravindran from Amirda. I have a question regarding uh, test 2, sir. In test 2, one question is there, that is an adiabatic process, which one, which statement is correct? The answers were P equal to constant, PV power gamma equal to constant, V equal to constant, PV equal to constant. Uh, usually we are using, if it is an adiabatic process, immediately we answer PV power gamma equal to constant. Gamma is an adiabatic index. But uh, after finishing our examination, we found that uh, all four statements were uh, correct. Is it correct, sir? If it is correct, how is it, sir? Please explain with uh, example, sir. Okay. Uh, just remind me in the afternoon, late afternoon, I will give you illustrations of all four processes being possible with the condition that it be an adiabatic process. Uh, this uh, actually it was a bit surprising to us because uh, you know usually our undergraduate students in the initial quizzes make this uh, error that the moment they uh, see the word adiabatic, 
adiabatic is equivalent to PV raise to gamma is constant. It is a simple pattern matching they do. Uh, and they forget that adiabatic only means no heat transfer across the wall, because it is defined as work transfer only. So, no heat transfer across the wall. So, uh, as you attend the lecture on open systems, let me nicely sketch uh, situations uh, which are uh, adiabatic and which have uh, the four uh, uh, possibilities, pressure equals constant, volume equals constant, temperature equals constant and as well as P V raise to gamma is constant. Okay? So, I will I'll do that homework and I will display those things in the afternoon. We already have some illustrations of these in the exercises sheet, if you wish to look at them in detail. Over and that brings us to the end of the morning discussion session.